Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to our Curious Amalgam. I'm Yana Seidel, and the title of today's episode is What's New in Antitrust and Tech? Unpacking FTC the Amazon. In late September 2023, the Federal Trade Commission and 17 state attorneys general filed a lawsuit against Amazon, bringing claims under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, Section 5 of the FTC Act, and various state laws. That suit came after months of speculation and anticipation and has been described as massive, a landmark monopoly lawsuit, and the lawsuit that could break up Amazon. It alleges that the company engaged in a scheme of anti-competitive and unfair conduct designed to expand and maintain an illegal monopoly in two purported markets, and that's the market for online marketplace services, which is where sellers buy services from Amazon, and the market for online superstores, which is consumer-facing. The complaint alleges there are feedback loops between these two markets. In this episode, we speak with our guest about the FTC and State AG's recent suit and its potential consequences for antitrust enforcement, consumers, and other firms competing in the online marketplace. Joining me today is my co-host, Barry Nigro. Barry, hello. Hi, Yana. How are you? Great. Who are we speaking with today, Barry? We are speaking with Adam Kavakovich. Adam is the CEO and founder of Chamber of Progress. Before founding Chamber of Progress, Adam served as a Google executive for over a decade and led government relations at the scooter company Lime. For his leadership in the field of tech policy, Adam was selected by Washingtonian for its 2023 list of DC's 500 most influential people. Adam, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let's start with a high-level overview of what's at issue in this case. The complaint focuses on two markets, one targeting consumers and the other sellers, and argues that feedback loops between these two markets promote scale and network effects, resulting in powerful entry barriers. According to the complaint, sellers are attracted to Amazon's marketplace services because of Amazon's pool of shoppers. The complaint also alleges that Amazon relies on those same sellers to increase the type and number of goods offered on its online superstore, which then further attracts shoppers. Let's start with the online superstore market. What is this market and why is it limited to just online? Sure. Well, of course, you know, there that's because the FTC has drawn it that way. And they though we don't know for sure who they have included else in that market, it's very likely that the market they've defined includes certainly Walmart, Target. There's some confusion about whether they include eBay in that market because they have some charts in their in their suit that include eBay, but it's not clear to me that eBay is necessarily included in that definition as an online superstore. And the FTC's construction of this market, it leads them to conclude that Amazon has a 60% share in that market. Of course, I think there there's considerable evidence that that's not how consumers see things. Most of the independent retail analysts have who have looked at this have said that Amazon has a probably about 37, 38% of all online retail and about three and a half, four percent of all retail altogether. And so I think that's where the you'll see the argument. I think when this finally gets to trial two, three years from now, we'll we'll focus on the market definition on the retail side, the market for consumers, which is separate from the market for shopper or for sellers rather. So the other market which you referenced is is the market for online marketplace services, which are purchased by sellers. Tell us a little bit about this market and what it means for the case. I think this one is much harder to understand, candidly. Again, the way that they've drawn the definition is that you know Amazon has a 60% share in it, but it's very unclear exactly how they've described it, who the FTC considers to be Amazon's competitor in this uh, marketplace seller services. Certainly, 
I think one of the most prominent competitors that they're going to find in this will be Shopify. And the reason why I say this is because let's say you're a seller of some good today and you've most sellers really today choose one of two options primarily they either choose to sell their goods through amazon's marketplace or they pursue a strategy where they go directly to consumer usually run ads on facebook and instagram to drive awareness of their product if it's a direct to consumer product and then they use shopify to sell process and fulfill that sale the facebook shopify Access is in many ways the leading alternative, but it operates differently because they're not necessarily handling all of the aspects of fulfillment that Amazon does. And so I do think that that on this question, the FTC's market definition is susceptible to an argument that they've drawn it in such a way that on, the Amazon is the only firm in that market, which of course creates all sorts of other issues. So it's common in these platform cases for the agencies and the parties to argue about network effects. This case is a little different in that the FTC seems to emphasize in its complaint the notion that that there's a feedback loop. They talk about how the strategy of linking the two markets you just just described as mutually reinforcing and, and interconnected. Can you talk a little bit about what that means for this case and why maybe the FTC included it as a part of the complaint? Sure. I think there's an open question about why they felt, why they pursued a strategy of saying these are two separate markets as opposed to one market. And I think there's been some writing. Bloomberg Law had a really great analysis of this that sort of suggested that they had done that because of the Supreme Court Amex decision. And and so by, by saying that these are sort of two distinct but potentially related markets. Maybe that's their way of kind of working around the Amex decision. But you're right. It's not really a, a core sort of network effects argument. So I don't know. I don't, I'm not totally sure how that will end up in unfolding. I do think that both of the individual market definition definitions are susceptible to you know opposition from Amazon on the, the grounds we described. And so the question of how linked they are together, I'm, I'm, I don't know how much that will play when this finally reaches trial. I, I always find these market definition questions to be super fascinating. Uh, turning to the conduct, so according to the complaint, Amazon's alleged anti-competitive practices consist of two related parts, right? So they're alleging anti-discounting practices that supposedly limit price competition, and then separately the linking of prime eligibility for sellers to use Amazon's fulfillment services. At first glance, those theories appear to be similar to kind of established antitrust theories of harm. So the most favored nation provisions and then tying. Can you talk to us about those theories of harm and kind of any distinctions that you see between the allegations that are in the complaint and what we've traditionally seen challenged as MFNs or tying? Sure. And actually, one of the things that's interesting about the two areas of the complaint is that they've already been the subject of lawsuits and in some cases, settlements in Europe. And so so let's take those in order. So the first I sort of call the buy box issue, which is that when you search, when you go into Amazon and you search for a hammer, let's say, you know, there are multiple sellers who are trying to sell that particular hammer to you through Amazon, but only one seller can be the seller that quote unquote wins the buy box. That's this box over to the right that when you click, you know, put this in my shopping cart that that's the that's the seller that earns that sale and amazon has a whole uh, algorithm to decide who is the seller that wins that buy box position and one of their policies one of their policies of many is that if that seller is found to be selling that product less expensively somewhere else off amazon that will be a negative signal in whether the seller is chosen to win the buy box. They can do it. It's just that they may not win the buy box. And this started as a plaintiff's lawsuit. There are two separate plaintiff's lawsuits in Washington state focused on this question, the buy box, the argument that it, that it essentially this ended up having the effect of raising prices for sellers off Amazon. 
and had an impact on consumer prices that way. It then morphed into a complaint by the former attorney general of D.C. That complaint was actually tossed out of federal court very early stage. The judge was very dismissive of that argument, saying that it actually had they had not at all provided any evidence that that this had happened. I think there's a lot of anecdotes, but I don't know that there's a lot of data on this point. Then last year, the California Attorney General, Rob Bonta, launched his own lawsuit against Amazon, which was focused on this issue as well. That will go to court in California, I believe, in 2026. And so this is the same argument. This is the argument that's been floating around for probably two years now. And and it seems to be largely based on some sellers. And there was a Bloomberg article in 2000, 2019 that seemed to kick off the interest in this topic. Some sellers saying that they they ended up raising prices elsewhere. Of course, that's they're in charge of their prices. And I think that will be a big part of Amazon's defense that they are responsible for their prices. Now, I said earlier that this both issues have been looked at by the Europeans. And so the EU, part of their settlement with Amazon last year on this question, on the buy box, the way they resolved it is Amazon agreed to offer to show a second seller in the buy box, not just the seller that's picked. And, the, and so they now show sort of an alternative seller in the buy box that was enough to satisfy their concern. But it is interesting because I think people think of the European regulators as, be, you know, the EU and European Commission as being, you know, more aggressive than Americans. And yet they were satisfied with that as a settlement. That's on the buy box. The tying question is a separate sort of separate question, which I'm happy to get into as well. Yeah, before we get to the tying question, the light went on in my head when you were talking about the other actions there, right? Are we looking at some preemption issues here? I don't know. I mean, it's it's also reasonable to it's also possible that these get combined. And I don't know if Amazon will make you know, that's what happened has happened in the in the Google search defaults case. It got com- the federal action, DOJ action got combined with the Colorado and, and other state attorney general action, even though they were actually slightly different issues. I think on the Google ad tech issues, there's, you know, they've, <laughs> it's been combined. And now this more recently, it's been split apart. And so I, I think that that will be a big question. I don't know about the, the preemption angle per se, but you have this issue that now has a nexus in the California state AG, these private cases in Washington state and the FTC case, which of course is also in Washington state court for now. Yeah. And then you mentioned the behavioral remedies. I also noticed that in the complaint, and you know, it's it's a lot of times the case that plaintiffs may not have specifically defined their asks when they filed a complaint, right? And when FTC Chair Lena Khan was asked on CNBC what the FTC wants here in terms of a remedy, the answer was that at this stage, this lawsuit is really about liability, but the complaint includes a request for a permanent injunction to prohibit the company's business practices at issue and any conduct that's kind of similar in effect, but it also includes a request for structural relief if necessary. So how, how do you square that when looking at what the FTC is looking at and some of the statements that they've made previously that behavioral remedies may not be something that they're happy with anymore compared to what the Europeans accepted? I think the way I think about it is that, you know, there's a, a, a real undercurrent of this case that is, you know, Chairwoman Khan's kind of agenda, longstanding agenda. And I accept that it's, these are different arguments than she made in her law school paper in 2017. But, you know, the, the way that the agencies have split up, you know, the big tech companies, it's it's it, it's very, it's, it's essentially a, a target in suit of a case, right? Because several years ago, the DOJ and the FTC said, DOJ, you, you know, you'll take Apple and Google, FTC, you'll take Amazon and Meta. And, you know, once that happened, it was inevitable, in my view, that the agencies would bring cases. And so I just think that, you know, there was a lot of reporting that last year, uh, 2022, that Chairwoman Khan had reorganized the team within the FTC looking at Amazon because she felt they had been taking too long to bring a case. And they spent, you know, an intense or more intense period of time over the last year bringing a case. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's well known at this point that she's not interested in settlements. She wants to bring these cases to expand the bounds of antitrust law. I think in particular, one of the things that even though these are traditional theories, many of them are about, in my view, protecting sellers rather than the consumer, even though it's, you know, they're, they're, she has a theory, they have a theory and they're connecting it to consumer harm. But I think it's, you know, the word sellers is mentioned 368 times. The word consumers is mentioned 51 times. And I just think that's, that's is a 
powerful signal of who's driv- who's driving these complaints. But the question of remedies, why did she include? It? I think because you know that's she she wants to sort of show you know this is the FTC swinging for the fences. I think that's deliberate. I just find it interesting that on the same issues, the European Commission settled, which is not something they normally do. And I think that this is the, the same two issues under previous democratic administrations probably would have been settled as well. There's clear, in my view, settlement opportunities with Amazon on both of these questions. Adam, you mentioned Chair Khan's law review article on Amazon, which outlined a, a long list of conduct about which she had concerned, had concerns and thought should be addressed through antitrust. The complaint in this case, however, is a lot more narrow. Were you surprised that the complaint wasn't broader than it is? I wasn't terribly surprised. I think one of the particular omissions that had been reported a lot in the last year, and frankly, which you know she had worked on even when she was working in Congress and wrote the House a Judiciary Committee, you know, report on big tech and antitrust. There was a lot of focus in that report on Amazon's store brands, Amazon Basics, Amazon's other store brands, and specifically this question of whether Amazon had sort of it was inappropriately using data on you know its marketplace sellers, its third party sellers, to decide which products to clone and do store brands on. We know this has been, you know, something she's interested in. As she, she, you know, again, she she worked on this when she was working on, in Congress too. But even earlier this year, this spring, when there were starting to be some press leaks about what was included in, in this complaint, that was not included. And so, I think personally, that's a sign that it would be very hard to bring a case against Amazon Basics or even Amazon's use of data to help. Amazon basic store brands, I think it's well established, are a money saver for cus- for consumers, and and you know there's nothing in my my view in on the, the law that would stop Amazon from using data to inform their store brand decisions, just like every just like Costco does with Kirkland and you know and Target does with their store brand, every other brand does uh, store with their with their store brands, but it wasn't in the complaint. The other thing that wasn't in the complaint was you know there had been press reporting again from the spring that the FTC was likely to include a a sort of a third argument that Amazon's bundle, its Amazon Prime bundle, was unfair to other online superstores, Target, Costco, Walmart. And the rumors was that this was going to be a kind of a raising rivals cost argument. That was not in there either. And my hunch, this is just a hunch, is that this summer, this last summer, when the FTC had essentially had its complaint written and even you know met with Amazon in mid-August, they started shopping the complaint around to state attorney general offices trying to see if they would join the complaint. And my strong suspicion is that state attorneys general were not supportive of bringing a case against the Amazon Prime bundle. The Amazon Prime bundle is really popular with consumers and uh, a lot of state AGs are electeds and they sort of know that. But maybe it's also that they felt that the legal arguments around it were not as strong as the others, perhaps. So the FTC brings this case. It alleges that Amazon is dominant, that it's engaging in conduct to deprive competitors of scale and scope. There's a feedback loop that is self-reinforcing. Amazon says, nope, we're just better than others. We provide a better service at a better price. We're more convenient. And the reason we're successful is because we provide the best service on the planet when it comes to getting goods to your home quickly and reliably. How do you think the judge is going to sort through all this and, and, you know, is the FTC going to win this case, lose this case? What, what, what's your view? Well, again, I don't think we'll know <laughs> for a long time just because, you know, so one of the other, I'm, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time watching the Google search default trial unfolding and I've been to court a couple of times. And, you know, it's, it's now 2023, it's three years after that was first filed. So I think, you know, it, it could be another three years before this one sees a trial. And my guess is Lena Khan probably will be gone from the FTC by then. 
so yes, I think that's I, I do think that that's a big part of it. They have pro consumer justifications. You see this in the Google case too, where the DOJ's argument is that Google's market share was a function of having these search default deals. Google's argument is no, it was about quality and search quality. And I think that it's going to be very. I think it's very difficult for any judge to sort that out conclusively. How do you sort out the factors in a company's, you know, success to, to any kind of degree of, of reliability? And and my so my hunch is that, you know, in that kind of dispute that the tip goes to Amazon in terms of, you know, establishing it. I think one of the other things that's interesting is that both of these complaints, both the F, a fulfillment by Amazon sort of tying argument and the buy box are really about how Amazon treats its marketplace sellers. And an important thing to say is that Amazon built all this infrastructure, all these where you know warehouses, data, software, all of this, originally to sell goods directly to consumers themselves. And then they open it up to third-party sellers. They didn't have to do that. And of course, naturally, that led to this universe of marketplace sellers basically building their business on the backs of Amazon's marketplace. But you know, in, in a way, and this is familiar because you see this in other tech antitrust complaints. They're now sort of it, the, the people who didn't did that are then sort of the locus of the complaints. And so I think that, you know, they're, they're, one of the things to watch for will sort of will be kind of this this argument that Amazon may argue, which is that they spent you know billions of dollars building this infrastructure and all of this learning, you know, decades of learning and then open it up and they didn't have to do that. And so I, I, I wonder that 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 might be a, a, a theme in their eventual defense as well. We've been talking about the Amazon case in particular. Let's talk about what it means for tech companies and the trend toward more aggressive enforcement with respect to tech companies. The FTC recently challenged Meta Within, arguing that the acquisition by Meta of the virtual reality app developer would reduce future competition in the nascent virtual reality market. Earlier this year, the FTC lost its bid for a preliminary injunction in the United States District Court for the Northern District of of California. The agency subsequently dropped its Part 3 proceeding. Similarly, the FTC also challenged the Microsoft Activision acquisition and lost its bid for a preliminary injunction there. What would another loss mean for the FTC? Well, I think there's no doubt that if you look historically about how, you know, federal trade commission chairs and and sort of, you know, during 10 years during administrations achieve things, they largely achieve things through settlements. If you look at sort of, you know, a win loss record, you know, settlements are where every federal trade commission achieves wins and concrete wins. And, you know, we know that that under Chair Khan, they are attempting to not attempting. They have mostly rejected settlements, at least on the antitrust context. They've done settle, settlements on the consumer protection side because there's a feeling that many some of those settlements were weak and they conceded too much to industry and that they didn't do anything to expand the boundaries of antitrust law, which is what she's interested in. And so uh, I don't know if, if if listeners of this podcast know the phrase YOLO, you only live once, but I sort of use that to describe, you know, their litigation strategy. It's it's deliberately bringing aggressive cases to an attempt to expand the bounds of antitrust law. And frankly, I think that they if they win in court and do that, they view that as a win. The, the thinking, I believe, is that it, even if they lose, there's a belief that that will spur Congress to change the law. Because, you know, if Amazon wins or if Facebook wins against the agency, well, then everyone must, you know, everyone agrees with us that Facebook and, and Amazon are so terrible that we'll, they'll, of course, rise up and change the law. I don't think that's going to be true, by the way. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if the net is just fewer wins overall from, a con, from, from Chairman Khan's tenure at the FTC. And I don't know that... She would view that as a negative because I don't think she I think she's just trying to do something completely different. She's not trying to leave with sort of a scoreboard of wins. I think she sees her tenure as different, which is much more about I'm going to bring uh, cases to expand the you know Overton window of 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 options and, and outcomes. So that that brings up another 
point, which is some have argued you don't need to win to win. And, and we saw in Meta Within that the court accepted the FTC's arguments with respect to the viability of potential competition theories and that if properly proven actual or perceived competition by an acquirer in the same market in which the target operates could be the basis for a viable theory of harm to competition under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. So even though the FTC wasn't successful in blocking the Meta Within and Microsoft Activision transactions, the court's decision was noteworthy and arguably advanced the ball and further Chair Khan's agenda. Do you have any thoughts on, on, on that position? Yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, a natural tendency to want to spin a loss as a win for something, <laughs> you know, oh, well, we, you know, we won on this, this small part of it. And that's a good building block. I understand that. I think everybody does that. And so I, I, I don't know that it's true. I, I'm kind of more interested in the fact that I think that, you know, I think when a lot of when, when Chairman Khan came in, and I think a lot of companies might have, you know, not done mergers or not done certain things because, you know, they were worried about being sued. I think that that's dissipated, frankly. I think losses, court losses, you know, I think arguably one of the ways which previous FTCs have been able to secure a lot of settlements is because of this threat to take the parties to court, and the parties didn't necessarily want to do that. Now that they are taking more parties to court, but losing, I think it is likely to result in a bit of a paper tiger situation where, you know, companies, I think, increasingly are going to take their chances and, you know, litigate mergers, for example, especially since I think in many cases, companies are already committing to things that judges will find you know, appealing in terms of remedies. I think this is certainly the, the case with Microsoft Activision. You know, Microsoft, I think, pretty skillfully put forward a set, set of public commitments that FTC rejected. And but then when it came to court, you know, the court said, well, this is kind of absurd. Why, why, you know, why, why didn't the FTC accept these things? The fact that Amazon has offered concessions on all of these issues to the European Commission, and they've been accepted, I wonder if it could lead to a similar dynamic because I didn't. I, I think most of these things are, are are addressable. So we've been talking about wins and losses, and losses that can be arguably viewed as wins, right? What what would it mean? What would the implications be if the FTC and the state AGs are successful in this suit here? Let's talk about. I mean, you touched on, for example, some defense arguments that Amazon may raise in terms of how much investment they've poured into opening up this platform and creating this marketplace that exists today, what would some of the implications of an outcome where the state AGs and the FTC win be, for example, on other big tech companies? Sure. Well, so again, just to take the two separate issues of this complaint, one is the, the buy box issue. I don't know how, uh, you know, I, 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 to the extent that Amazon could be precluded from picking a seller based on, you know, them not having a, a lower price somewhere else, that runs a risk that you know, Amazon ends up having to show a non-competitive seller, basically a seller that's not going to be the best price, which I think would be terrible for Amazon customers and, you know, maybe good for other retailers, but but bad for the value they're providing to customers. We haven't talked too much yet about the other argument around kind of the link between Amazon Prime and Amazon's in-house fulfillment network of uh, fulfillment by Amazon. But, you know, the general the general idea behind that is that if, if you're a marketplace seller and you want your your product to be labeled a prime, Amazon Prime label, what that means the consumers, it's going to get there in two days. So in order to get there in two days, Amazon requires you to use their fulfillment service, fulfillment by Amazon, so that they can guarantee that it gets there. That involves fees to merchants, which not all not all those merchants like, but which you know Amazon argues are competitive compared to other services they might use. Interestingly, Amazon has had this program called Seller Fulfilled Prime that they launched, I think, in 2016, which was an alternative to fulfillment by Amazon. It said, okay, seller, you can have your service, your, your product have that prime label on it, and you can ship it yourself, but it has to meet our shipping standards. 
what they found when they tried this was that only 16% of products under seller fulfilled prime made it to the consumer on time. So it was a really bad experience that led to complaints for, from, from customers. And they've more recently reopened the program with much stricter quality standards. The Europeans, when they looked at this, the European commission, their settlement with Amazon was that Amazon offers seller fulfilled prime can offer seller fulfilled prime has to offer seller fulfilled prime to merchants as an alternative and amazon can ensure that participants in that program meet their high standard so this to me kind of speaks to again this sort of inherent tension in the case between the complaints of sellers that i think have driven this and the interests of consumers because you know if the if amazon were to say break that link the reality is the probably biggest implication is that prime products couldn't get to the to, couldn't get to the customer on time, right? And so I just you know think that would be really bad for consumers who've really come to depend on this. And and frankly, Amazon's invested you know billions of dollars in the shipping and fulfillment infrastructure to make that possible. And we t- we talked about the implications of the case depending on whether the FTC wins or loses. What effect is this case already having, if any, on Silicon Valley? on tech startups and other big tech companies? I don't know. I think it's a little early to tell because so far, all of the targets of these suits, Google, Amazon, Meta, the FTC suit are challenging the suits. And I think all have strong defenses. And so I don't think it's necessarily having an effect on conduct because I think, you know, they feel rightly in my view that they have pro-competitive justifications for these behaviors. Setting that aside, there are probably types of acquisitions. There are definitely types, sizes of acquisitions that the big tech companies can't do, but, you know, in this environment and, and, you know, and some kind of bemoan that, but I just think that's just, that's just real realistic. And I think they've accepted that for the most part, to the extent they're doing acquisitions, the big tech companies are more likely doing small, what are called aqua hire acquisitions, where they're hiring a small team. You know, Facebook isn't going to acquire Snapchat. <laughs> that's like, that's not going to happen, right? And I think everybody knows that's not going to happen. Adam, well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights. That was a really fascinating conversation. We'll all have to kind of stay tuned as the case works its way through litigation over the next couple of years, like you mentioned. Before we let you go, we have a few questions for you to help our audience get to know you personally a bit better. So the first one is, what advice do you have for young lawyers or economists? Frankly, I think one of the things I've seen is learn technology now, because I think there's so many interesting emerging legal issues around emerging technology. Again, you know, sitting through the Google case recently and hearing all this discussion of real time bidding on the advertising side and display advertising. I think this Amazon case, there's a lot of interesting questions about logistic services. There's a whole host of suits coming around AI and copyright. The lawyers who learn technology substantively, I think we'll really have a leg up. So Adam, a second question for you. Tell us something interesting about yourself that we would not know if we only knew you professionally. I am a huge fan of The Bachelor TV show and more recently started watching The Golden Bachelor, the new spinoff. I have watched it so much with my wife and, and been so annoyed when contestants on the show just do dumb things to hurt their chances that I thought someday I should write a book on how to do well on this show. I discovered last year that somebody had written that book. I read the book. It's amazing. So I highly recommend for any bachelor fans out there. I I assume you bought bought the book on Amazon. (laughs) I'll have to take a look for it. (laughs) Well, thanks Adam again. And thanks everyone for listening. We hope you tune in next week. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. 
You can learn more about our podcast at, at OurCuriousAmalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at OurCuriousAmalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.